Our first reading is from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, as I said. <laughs> Throughout the letter, Paul shows his abilities to argue and employ rhetoric using arguments and metaphors that his Greco-Roman listeners would easily understand. But the opening of his letter, fitting well with the conventions of ancient letter writing, show that before Paul is a theologian or a philosopher, he's a pastor and a friend, committed to maintaining relationships with churches that he could not be with in every moment. Uh, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be the saints together with all those who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ, for in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end so that you may be blameless on our day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into partnership of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Some might accuse Paul of being a little wordy in how he opens his correspondences, but I kind of like it. <laughs> Our gospel reading this morning is from John's gospel, from the first chapter, starting in the 29th verse. John here testifies, John the Baptist that is, testifies to who Jesus is and what he thinks this means. And later on in the passage, Jesus calls Simon and Andrew to follow him inviting them into a new kind of community. Hear these words from the Gospel of John. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and testified that this is the chosen one. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples. And as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, what are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother, Simon, and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed one. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. 
The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you be with me in prayer? Spirit of the living God, fall afresh upon us this day. Open our hearts and our minds to your word spoken among us. And make the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Start writing at the absolute latest moment that you can and still tell the story effectively. That's advice for good writing, good compelling stories. Don't waste your time on this long lead up. The ancient word for this is to begin an media race in the midst of things, right in the beginning of it. We want the beginning of the story to grab us. It has to grab us and pull us in if we're going to stick around and pay attention, right? Think about it. You walk past or drive past or whatever, lots of people regularly. All of those people have a really interesting, long, complicated story. But we don't stop and ask them for their stories. We don't stop and ask because it's hard to really get invested in someone we don't know. We have to know at least something about them. Perhaps it's because what strangers on the street story is is none of our business, but you get the idea. Something has to pull us in, make us want to know more. One of my favorite movies is The Big Lebowski. I think it's brilliant. I think it's funny. I even think it's important. And I think it has a fantastic opening scene. A tumbleweed drifts along above Los Angeles and through Los Angeles. Sam Elliott's deep voice pulls us in. We see the dude wandering a grocery store in a bathrobe, not unlike this one. We start to wonder, who is this guy? And then within a few moments, a couple of guys break into his apartment and try to drown him in his toilet. Now you have my attention. What's going on? Who is this? Tell me more. If you want someone to pay attention, you've got to have a pretty good answer to the question, why should I care about this? Why does this matter? I might be losing some of you already this morning, so please bear with me. Both of our readings this morning begin in media race in their own ways. Paul begins by telling the readers who he is, and there's a lot tied up in that. He doesn't start anywhere near the beginning of his life. He begins with what would be the salient, interesting part. Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus, a messenger of God. Similarly, John grabs our attention in his gospel when John the Baptist says, Hey, that's the guy I was talking about, the Lamb of God. Now, of course... Grabbing attention is not the same as telling a story. In order to be truly drawn into a story, we need to actually feel invested in the characters. There has to be some sort of tension, some idea or question that drives the story forward. The story has to be an effective so what. It has to convince us sometimes over and over and over again, that there is something here that deserves our attention, that we're moving towards something. In order to hold our interest, stories have to develop in complexity beyond that first gotcha moment. We have to get a sense that there is much more beneath the surface than we've initially seen. We sort of assume that because we know how stories work. That's why we ask questions because we know that there is a story behind why things happen. When we see these two guys repeatedly dunking the dude's head into his toilet asking, where's the money Lebowski? 
We know that there are elements of this story we are yet to learn. It's not inherently interesting that someone's getting their head dunked in a toilet. We have to sort of assume there's more going on here. Paul begins his letter to the Corinthians in a way that draws them in, but it is his incredible ability to make sense of their world in the light of Christ's death and resurrection that makes the letter as a whole compelling. It's why people kept reading. If the whole bit was that he fell off a horse and saw God, that wouldn't really be a great story. If the whole point of the letter was, I'm Paul and I'm writing to you, that wouldn't be interesting at all, and the letter probably would not have survived. What would have been the point? Paul's letter lays out his understanding of what Jesus means to this new community and how that is supposed to inform their lives together. It is relevant and interesting because it is concerned with the questions that drove that community forward. How should we live in the light of this new revelation, this thing that has happened? What does it mean to truly be sharing the table with everyone? Paul had to keep convincing his readers over and over again that this story that they were part of was a compelling one, that it was going somewhere, that they shouldn't tune out just yet. I think that's one of the things that it's really easy to forget about Jesus' life and ministry. We get these little snapshots of his life, like this one with John, where John the Baptist shouts that this is the Lamb of God. We see the way he impacted people, the way people respond to him, and it's easy to forget that these happened in a context. We don't really know what the conversation with Andrew and the other unnamed disciple was, people didn't just see him and say, oh, that's the Lamb of God. I better go and follow him. People would have naturally asked, what in the world is the Lamb of God? Why does that matter to any of us? John announces who he believes Jesus is, what he believes Jesus is, the one for whom He had come to prepare the way. But that alone isn't really interesting. What drives the story forward, the Jesus story, the gospel story, is what happens next. Andrew decides to ask that question. Sometimes we're afraid to ask, so what? He goes and spends time with Jesus He develops this character a little bit, learning the backstory and what motivates him. He learns what Jesus is all about. I have to imagine he asked a ton of questions. I wonder if they argued a bit. Perhaps they didn't actually agree on anything, but they were willing to stay in the story because they had a question, an idea that drove them forward that felt like it transcended simply agreeing. They wanted to be in relationship for a little while longer. I have to imagine that if Jesus had not been willing to dwell in the questions with Andrew, if he simply told Andrew, be quiet, I'm the Lamb of God, I'm telling you some dogma now, Andrew might have walked out of that place by 4.30 in the afternoon, feeling like he'd wasted the afternoon. The same way you feel when you spend hours over several months or years following a television series only to have the writers deliver a sloppy, lazy ending. Like Seinfeld or Game of Thrones. Some of the famous flops finales. But Andrew goes to his brother, leaves from Jesus, goes to his brother Simon and says, we have found the Messiah. Now believe me, if I ever get to write a screenplay or direct a movie about Jesus, this is where it's going to begin. A close-up shot of Andrew leaning in towards his brother and saying in a really conspiratorial tone, We found him. 
That's the latest possible moment. That would draw me in. That's the Jesus movie I want to see. Start it right there. Now, the beginning of the story is easy to imagine, right? It's easy to grab attention. And, you know, most of us can usually think of a pretty good ending for a story, right? A good idea. What if some people this and then eventually they this? But the middle is really hard to write. The middle of the story is where people have to make difficult choices, encounter unexpected twists. It's where we have to keep getting pulled along. It's where things get more complex. It's where you lose people. I was installed yesterday as your pastor, and while I've been among you for a little over six months, this feels like it's the beginning of a story, or at least the moment in maybe a race, in the midst of it, where it makes sense to really start telling this story. And as we do that, I want to start where Paul starts, where Paul always seems to start. Thank you. Thank you, God, for the people of Westminster, for this community that time and time again shows each other what it means to be transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. I've said this to some of you, many of you, but from the moment your search committee appeared in their little Zoom boxes on the screen, I knew this is where I was supposed to be. I knew this is where I wanted to be. And every day has confirmed that for me so far, more and more. I want to be your pastor more now than I did yesterday. And I think when I wake up tomorrow, I'm going to want that even more. But I'm not naive. I know that there will be a day, there will probably be many days, when it's a little harder to feel that. And I know that there will be days when some of you don't agree with me. If everything goes according to plan, and we enjoy a long, vibrant ministry relationship, guess what? We're going to bump up against each other. We're going to say things in anger or frustration. We've got a long middle of this story to write together, I hope. And that's just how these things tend to go. So before we hit that point, while we're still in this space where we love each other, where it's uncomplicated, where everything's perfect and we're super excited about the future, I hope you can all join me in remembering what story it is we're telling here at Westminster and the question that drives it forward because the question wasn't asked yesterday, the question was asked a long time ago. The question as I can see it is how do we live in the light of Christ? Now that question might sound a little too simplistic or maybe it's actually too broad, too vague, too big of a question. So maybe we sharpen it a bit. If Jesus is who they say Jesus is, what does it mean to be a Christian community? I like starting that question with if. There's a great freedom in that. I think a lot of Christians, I know I was for a long time, are afraid to make that a conditional phrase. It's much more comfortable to put our feet on a rock and say, because of who Jesus was. But it's really an if for us, isn't it? Any great story requires us to buy into the premise. We have to accept the author's terms. And as Christians, we are called to live as if Jesus is indeed the Messiah, the Son of God, the Word made flesh, the model for our lives together. As if everything we do together here is part of that story that started in media race a long, long time ago, whose ending is love, the love that brings all creation into communion. I think... Paul was on to something. 
He begins every letter he writes with thanksgiving for the community that he is writing to. He gives thanks for them. He encourages them. When there are disagreements, and in Paul's case, there are plenty, Paul always errs on the side of maintaining fellowship with people, even difficult people, even when it's hard. In his letter to the Corinthians later on, Paul addresses the question of people with different dietary ethics, Jews and Greeks sharing the table, and his answer is really pretty complex, but pretty simple. Do whatever you have to do to make everyone comfortable. If people have hang-ups about eating meat, don't eat meat when you're with them. Rather than simply saying, oh, it's all a matter of opinion, it's up to your own consciences, Paul urges the community to go farther than that, to make every effort to welcome each other and to ensure that nobody is left out. It is a theology of radical welcome and accommodation. Church, I think that's your model here at Westminster. I hope that can be our model for a long time. Like Paul, I believe that the most important work we can do is to stay at the table with one another. We might disagree, we will at times. We will all have differences in how we understand God and Jesus and what that means and how the Spirit moves among us. But if we commit ourselves to staying at the table with one another, to staying engaged in asking the question and following the middle of this story, writing the middle of this story, even when it gets difficult, then I believe we will truly be living as if Jesus Christ is alive among us, right here in our presence, living and breathing as this body of Christ. That's my hope and my prayer for you, Westminster, for us, that in all things we can bear with one another. That in the joyous times, and may there be many, and in the difficult times, and there will be some, we can stay committed to the belief that God is capable of making more of us together than we could ever be apart. You have heard me say that almost ad nauseum, but I believe it to the core of my being. I believe that our stories are more real, more true when we are in fellowship, that when we choose to be in loving, respectful, healthy relationships, God is present with us. It doesn't mean we don't argue. In fact, part of really loving and respecting each other is having enough trust in one another to know that our feelings of frustration or anger or disappointment will be received with grace. And relationships that have real value are worth dealing with those uncomfortable moments. Part of loving each other is being willing to go through those tough times because the totality of our relationship transcends any of the discrete moments. And I pray that we will truly, truly savor the moments that are particularly sweet. Because they are not simply nice memories, they are the presence of God's living spirit. They are the divine love incarnate among us as the body of Christ. God has begun a great work among us, Westminster, a long, long time ago before a cornerstone was laid. We have started our chapter of the story together and made a race. And while there is nothing as dramatic as someone demanding money while dunking someone's head in the toilet, I feel really pulled into this story. I want to know more of who these characters are who we are together, and where this story is headed. So may it be among us, Westminster, to the joy that lies ahead and to the glory of God, the greatest scriptwriter that ever there was, who lives and breathes in this place. Amen. Amen.